Thank you, gentlemen, for your help with the music this morning. Go ahead and take out your Bibles. Turn to the book of Judges. Book of Judges. Uh, but today we're going to start a new series. We're going to start a couple new series. Come back tonight at 5 o'clock, and uh, we'll be in, a, in a, another series, a new series tonight in the book of Philippians. Uh, it's called Joy Even Though. Joy, even though, that's what we'll be looking at on Sunday nights for the next several weeks, uh, next few months, really. Joy, even though. And you think about last year, you think about 2020, and, and how really for so many people it was such a bad year. But yet even despite all of that, even though it was a horrible year, we as followers of Christ can still have joy because of Jesus. And here we enter into 2021. And like I said, I've already, uh, even just in the last couple days, I've seen folks and heard different folks on Facebook and different places where things have already, you know, happened. Uh, uh, someone that I went to school with years ago, she was a couple years ahead of me. Uh, she, she posted just yesterday that her, her father had passed away yesterday. Uh, other folks have, you know, said, hey, I'm, I'm sick. You know, they got sick the first couple days. So 2021 doesn't magically make everything disappear. However, just like in 2020 and 2019 and 18 and 17, and any year you put, you put in there, we can still have joy, even though things may be bad around us. We can still have joy in Jesus. And so we're going to be looking on Sunday nights at the book of Philippians, talking about joy. I mean, Paul, just a little, you know, teaser here. Paul was in prison writing about the joy that he had in Christ, writing about how God was able to meet all of his needs, writing about how God was his strength, even while he was in prison. And so come tonight, we'll get started in that series. But on Sunday mornings, we're starting a new series for 2021. So the first Sunday morning, first day of a new series, we're going to be in the book of Judges. And this is a series that I've actually, I've wanted to do for about a year and a half now. Two years ago, 2019, we started out the year in the book of Joshua, and it took us into June of that year. And as soon as we finished it, the very next book is Judges, and I wanted to go right into that, but the Lord wouldn't allow me. He, he had other things, and so uh, we, we, we jumped into other things. And as soon as I would finish one series, I'm like, all right, Lord, can I go back to Judges now? And it was just constant, no, no, no. And then as I was praying again to get this year started, I said, okay, let's go to Judges now. So we're in Judges, again, something I've wanted to be in for a year and a half. So I'm excited. I'm excited about a new year. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing uh, in us, through us, around us. Us. I'm excited about the uh, studies that we're going to be uh, jumping into uh, here as we start the year. So we're going to be in, the, uh, in this series on Judges. Now before we jump into the series, I want to give a few comments just to make sure we're all kind of going the same direction when it comes to Judges. Just kind of give some preliminary information, some background information about the book of Judges. Now the first thing I want to do is kind of dispel that image of what most of us think of when we hear the word judge. Because right now, when, when we say we're going through the book of Judges, a lot of us automatically, we picture the guy in the black robe or the lady in the black robe with a gavel and they're sitting behind a large bench and they're, you know, whacking that gavel on the bench, order in the court, order in the court. That is not what we're going to be reading about in the book of Judges. All right, in the book of Judges, these judges were not what we picture in our modern context. They actually, what, what I, one person uh, I heard said, uh, they were more like regional, political, military leaders. Also tribal chieftains. As a matter of fact, as we study the book of Judges, we're going to find that none of them actually kind of ruled over all of Israel at any time. They were certain regions. And there's actually going to probably be some overlap of the judges because one might have been over one region of Israel while another was over another region at the same time. So there's some overlap. So first of all, these are not judges like we picture. As a matter of fact, the judges that we're going to read about in the book of Judges, if you put a gavel in their hand or any hammer-shaped object, more than likely they would crack it over someone's head rather than saying order in the court and hitting a bench. Like that's just to give you a little idea about the judges that we're going to be talking about in the book of Judges. The second thing I want us to consider as we get started in this series, the title of the book is Judges. The main character in the book of Judges are not any of the judges. Now that may be, okay, well, wait a second. Now why do they call it Judges if it's not really about the Judges? Hey, we're going to talk about the Judges, but I want you to understand, in the book of Judges, as with all of human history, as with all of the Bible, the main character, if you will, the main point is not going to be the people. It's not going to be any judge or anybody else. It's God. And so throughout the book of Judges, we're going to see God working. As a matter of fact, I've called this series Judges, Fallen People, Faithful God. 
So it's kind of like, despite what the people do, look how faithful God still is. Look how that God had made some promises to the people of Israel. And by extension, we're going to see some things that we apply in our lives. Look what God has promised in our lives. We may stray, we may fall, but God is always faithful to receive us back and to forgive us whenever we humble ourselves and we repent. And we're going to see that in the book of Judges. We're going to see a cycle, and I'm not going to go deep into this today. We'll talk more about it next week. But there's a cycle throughout the book of Judges. They do the same thing over and over and and over again and God is faithful the entire time and so we see God being faithful now when we say God being faithful a lot of times we want to talk about God being faithful to bless God being faithful to provide God being faithful to forgive there's another side of God's faithfulness we, we really don't like God is faithful to punish you see, when we stray, when we rebel, when we sin, God is faithful to punish. So we're going to see God's faithfulness throughout the book of Judges. So the Judges are not the main point of the book. God is. So we're going to see that. And then the third thing by way of introduction, before we jump in, the third thing I want you to understand. The book of Judges is not for the faint of heart. Like the book of Judges is not at any time going to be made into like a Disney cartoon, okay? The book of Judges is not G-rated. If anything, I would say the book of Judges in many parts is R-rated because of the violence and because of the wickedness that's mentioned in it. Now, I know parents with kids in here were like, uh, wait a second. There are going to be parts of Judges that I'm just going to glance over, that I won't go into great detail. I'll probably say, adults, go ahead and read that on your own time and your devotions this week. All right. Or, or I, you know, I might even just skip over it completely rather even rather than just glance over it, just say, hey, we're going to jump over this portion. Read it later. Just suffice it to say there was some great wickedness going on at this time. So don't worry. I know if, if you maybe in your devotion start, hey, you know, we're going to be studying judges. I need to start reading it so I can be familiar with it. And I encourage you to do that. But when you get to some of these really bad parts, well, what's the preacher going to do whenever he comes to that? How's he going to preach on that? I, I'm going to be careful with it. OK. So I just want to give you that going into it. But I do want you to know the book of Judges is not for the faint of heart. It is very intense. Now, with those things being out of the way, those things being said about Judges, kind of laying the groundwork for Judges, I want us to jump in to today's message, the first message in this series. And the first message I'm titling, But First, But First. Now, how many of you, just show of hands real quick, I want some crowd participation. How many of you are coffee drinkers? Man, there's a lot of you. Okay, all right. I, I am not. But I do know the coffee drinkers that I know. How many of you, of those that are coffee drinkers, how many of you have to have your coffee before you do anything else? Right, just about the same number of hands went back up. Maybe some of you even have, I got a picture here, maybe you have a mug or a sign like this uh, in your house. But first, coffee. Like before anything else, I've got to have my coffee. Well, listen, today, before we jump into anything else, we're going to look at this message entitled, But First. Before we can see where Israel is and what, what's going to happen in the book of Judges, we've got to get some context. So before we do that, I tricked you a little bit. I told you to turn to the book of Judges. Turn back one page. Our first message in the book of Judges is going to be in Joshua, okay? I know, I just messed the whole thing up there. But before we can look at Judges, we really got to get an understanding of where we are in the life of Israel, in their history. So the first lesson, the first message from the book of Judges will be out of Joshua 24. Joshua 24. Now, Joshua 24 at the end, when we looked at this, it's been a year and a half, so I'm going to give a little recap. Remember, this is the, the end, of, end of Joshua. The children of Israel have been brought into the promised land under Joshua's leadership. They, they, we've seen mighty victories. We've seen mighty defeats. There was a lot of stuff. Uh, if you wanted to, if, you, if you've got like six months spare time and you want to, this was a series we did in 2019. It's, uh, we just had the audio. We don't have video. We didn't start doing that till this year. But we've got the audio messages on the sermon site. So you can go and listen to them if you really want to kind of get a grip of what's going on in the history of Israel. But when we, when we looked at Joshua 24, we've actually covered Joshua 24 two different times. The first Father's Day that I was here, I brought a message from Joshua 24 and from Joshua's final address to the people, choose you this day whom you will serve. 
And then a year later, we were in the study of Joshua. And I didn't plan to do the same passage on Father's Day again. But the way the study fell, we finished that series on Father's Day. So I preached the exact same passage, just a different take on it. So we've covered Joshua 24 twice. We've covered it each time from the, the standpoint of these were Joshua's last words to Israel. These were the last, cha- the last challenge that he brought to them. Today, I want us to look at it a little differently, though. Today, we're not going to look at it from Joshua's perspective. We'll read what he said to the people. We'll see the challenge. We'll hear his words. But I want us to look today from the perspective of the people, from the perspective of the nation of Israel. Because you see, they're going to make some promises in Joshua 24 that in Judges chapter 1, they break. Like it's that quick. Now, there's a little bit of space that goes between the two, uh, but still, it's not a whole long time. It's not like 500 years later they've broken their promise. It's maybe a couple years, a few years later they've broken their promises. But I want us to get this idea uh, that we see from Joshua 24. Here's where the nation of Israel was spiritually, militarily. Here's where they were in Joshua 24. So that next week when we get to Judges, Chapter number one and chapter number two, we'll we'll know exactly what they said they were going to do when we see what they actually did. All right, so let's read in Joshua chapter 24. We're going to read verses 14 through 29. So before we get to Judges, but first, before we get there, we've got to look at the end of Joshua. So Joshua 24 verses 14 through 29 says this, Now therefore, this is Joshua speaking, Now therefore fear the Lord. And serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And here's the most famous verse of this section. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went. And among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your trespasses nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it hath heard heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his own inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. As we see here, it's... Joshua's final challenge to the people, but again, we're going to focus not on that. We're going to focus on Israel's response to this challenge. Again, God has brought them into the promised land. Joshua, their leader, is about to die. There's more work to be done. Now, now, whenever you look at the book of Joshua, you see some great victories, but they're not finished. And we'll see that in Judges chapter 1. They're not done. There's more to be done. And so Joshua challenges them as they go forward. Here's some things you need to do, and here is their response. Three things I see in this passage in their response. First thing we see in verses 16 through 18, I see that Israel declared their dependence on God. Israel declared their dependence on God. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. 
The first step to deciding to live for the Lord is recognizing that you need the Lord to live. The first step to deciding to live for the Lord is recognizing that you need the Lord to live. Every one of us here today, we woke up this morning, we drew a breath, we, we got out of bed, we, we got a shower, we ate breakfast, we got dressed. All the things that you did to get here today, you did not do it on your own. It wasn't in your own strength. It wasn't because you're really powerful. It wasn't because you're really great, although you all are, of course. It wasn't that. It was because God allowed it to happen. God gave you the breath to breathe. God gave you the strength to rise out of your bed this morning. It is all because of God that we do anything. And if we're going to commit to living for him, then we've got to recognize the only reason that I can is because I depend on him to live. The only way that I can live for him is to recognize that I need him in order to live. The people, as Joshua said, what are you going to do? You've got to make a choice. You can't want, I'm about to be gone. I'm about to die. My time is done. You have to make a choice. What are you going to do when Moses isn't here, when Joshua isn't here? What are you going to do? What decision are you going to make for your family? What decision are you going to make for your community? What decision are you going to make when it comes to following the Lord? And so the people said, we're going to follow him. He said, you got to make a choice. Who are you going to follow? And they declared their dependence on God. Now, what we see in verses 16 through 18, they didn't just sit back and like, oh, man. Well, Joshua, I mean, if you say we should follow God and that's what you're going to do, then I mean, I guess that's what we should do. I guess we should follow God. I mean, I don't know anything about him. I never heard of the guy, but you seem to say he's pretty good. Like you ever go somewhere based on someone else's recommendation? You've never been there. Maybe it's a restaurant. And someone's like, you have got to try this out. And you're like, eh, I don't know. I'm just going because they said so. Hey, that's not what Israel did. They didn't say, we're going to follow God because Joshua said so. In verses 16 through 18, they step back and they give a history lesson. Like Joshua already did, but now they step back and they kind of tell the story from their perspective. Rather than him standing before them and saying, you need to serve God because he's done this, 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 and this. They step back and say, you know what? You're right. We need to make a choice. And we're going to choose to serve God. And we're not going to choose to serve God, Joshua, just because you said so. We're not going to choose to serve God just because the preacher said so. We're not going to choose to serve God just because mom and dad said so. We're not going to choose to serve God for any other reason than this. We've seen how good God is. And we need him every day. And they go back. They give a history lesson. They recognized, first of all, that God was the one who brought them out of bondage in Egypt. He is the one that through those plagues, remember the ten plagues, how that God brought Moses in there. Moses, you know, Charlton Heston stood before Pharaoh, said, let my people go. And, and then, you know, Pharaoh, no, I'm not going to do it. And so one by one, these different plagues from God came upon the nation of Egypt. And one by one, you know, the, the Pharaoh would say, okay, fine, take them, get out. He turned the water to blood, get out. Never mind, I changed my mind. There were flies, locusts, boils. Uh, there were uh, flies, frogs. There were all these things that happened. And each time, Pharaoh said, get out. And then changed his mind. Until the last one, which was the death of the firstborn. And at that point, Pharaoh said, get out. I don't ever want to see you again. And God, through this series of plagues, Brought, uh, brought Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of the slavery they had been in for many, many, many years. He brought them out to lead them to the promised land. The people said, Joshua, we're going to follow God because he's the one that brought us out. And it wasn't Moses and it wasn't Joshua, it was God. Then they also said God was the one who provided for us in the wilderness. It, it wasn't Moses that made the water come out of the rock, it was God. It wasn't Moses that, that put the manna on the ground for us each morning. That was God. It wasn't Moses or Joshua or anybody else that, that allowed our clothes to never decay or, or, or never wear out, our shoes to never wear out. That was all God. So we're going to follow God because he took care of us in the wilderness. We're going to follow God because when we were in the wilderness and we would go through a people that were not friendly to us, it was God that protected us and brought us through. And then finally, they said in this passage, not only that, I mean, can you, as if one of those things wasn't enough, 
We're going to follow God because, and they're listing thing after thing after thing. And they said, not only that, it was God who divided the waters of the Jordan River. It was God who brought us into this land that he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was God that once we came into the land, he's the one that gave us the victories. It was God that knocked down the walls of Jericho. It was God that made the sun to stand still so we could have the victory in that battle. It was God, as we see it earlier in Joshua 24, it was God that sent hornets to drive out our enemies. All of that was God. And so they said, we are going to serve God. Joshua, not because you said so, not because mom and dad said so. We're going to serve God because we've seen what he can do. And there's not a breath that we could breathe if it wasn't for God. And so they declared their dependence on God. They declared their dependence on the one who had proven himself time and time again, who had shown how faithful he was. Remember in Judges, we're going to see the faithfulness of God seen over and over. He, he had always been faithful. And he always would be faithful to Israel. Listen, to you, he has always been faithful and he always will be faithful. That doesn't mean, again, that, hey, he's just going to pour out riches on you because that's what you think God should do. He should bless me and he should give me all kinds of money. God's faithful to his word. And that sometimes means that you need to be punished and I need to be punished because God is faithful. So the people declared their dependence on God. They step back and they recognize that they could do nothing without him. They would be nothing without him. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just stopped, especially right here, the very beginning of a new year? It's a great time. Everyone kind of looks at a new year. It's just kind of that hitting the reset button, starting over, starting over fresh. Like this year's going to be different. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to, my house is going to be cleaner all year. I'm going to, and, and we have all this list of things to do. Hey, listen, in this new year, as we're stepping back and we're wiping the slate clean, maybe, maybe you straight a little bit. Now's a great time to say, Lord, I know I need you. God, you've been so good to me. God, I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you. Sure, there have been some times that were tough. There's been some difficulties. There's been loss. And, and God, I know even in the midst of all of the difficulties of life, even in the midst of the loss of loved ones, even in the midst of sickness, God, you've always been there. Because he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so today, maybe to start off this new year, we need to just say, God, I want to serve you. I want to serve you because I depend on you. You are the answer to all of my needs. You are the answer to everything that I could ever want. God, I need you. And I want to declare my dependence on you today. That's what Israel did. When Joshua challenged them, they declared their dependence on God the Father. But they didn't stop there. Like, that's big. I mean, that's, that's, man, that's a great place to start. But see, it's only a place to start. You could say, God, I depend on you and I want to live for you. All right, what else? Well, they said, there's some more things you want to say. Not only do we depend on God, not only are we going to live for God, not only are we going to stand here before you, Joshua, and make this promise, not only are we going to follow him, but they denied their devotion to false gods. Said, hey, it's not enough that we just say, hey, God, we love you, serve you, need you, want to be close to you. In order to do that, we got to get rid of some of the junk. We got to get rid of some of the things in our life. Hey, God was really clear to Israel coming up to this time. He, he was very clear of how he felt about sharing his holiness, about how he felt with sharing the worship of the people. He didn't like it. Many times God is called a jealous God. If you were to turn over to Exodus chapter 20, that's where we find what we call the Ten Commandments. I mean, there were 613 commands that the, that the Israelites had, as that God had given them in the law. 613. But there are ten that were the big ones. The top ten, if you will. His top ten commandments. You know what number one was? Thou shalt have no other God before me. And then number two and three, don't make any idols and don't worship any idols. So God was pretty clear, I am to be the only one that you worship. And so it wasn't enough for them to say, God, we like you, we depend on you, we're going to worship you. Throughout the Bible, there were many people that said, God, we're going to love you and worship you in addition to our other gods. 
We're going to add God Jehovah to the other ones in case we miss anybody. Like it, it, we want to serve all of them because what if Jehovah's only good for this part of my life, but this other God is good for this part. And so we need to worship all of them. We'll add Jehovah to the others. Israel said, we're, we're, we're declaring our dependence on God, on Jehovah, the one who brought us out of Egypt, the one who's taking care of us. We're declaring our depends on, dependence on him and we're denying these false gods. We're putting them away from us. We, we don't want to have anything to do with this because God said, no other gods before me, no idols. Don't bow down to anyone but me. Jesus even confirmed that over in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 6, we talked about this a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night. We were talking about money. And remember, Jesus said that no man can serve two masters. He'll love one, hate the other, cling to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, in that context and what he was saying, you can't serve God and money. You can't have, you know, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to serve money at the same time. But really, you could plug anything in there. Jesus was talking about money, but you could plug any other thing there. I'm not going to serve God and, and whatever that idol is. That just came to your mind? Yeah, you can't serve that and God. We can only serve God faithfully if we get rid of the idols. The people knew this. We know this. We know that God has to be first and only in our lives. But how many times do we let something else creep in? How many times do we say, hey, we'll just stay at home this Sunday because this is happening? That's an idol. Anything that takes the place of God, anything that is lifted above God is an idol. In Israel, they knew they weren't supposed to have idols, but continually we see that they did. Coming out of Egypt, where's Moses? He's been on that mountain a really long time. What if he doesn't come back? What if God has left us? You know what we should do? We should worship a God that we worshiped in Egypt. Let's build us a golden calf. When they got into the promised land, after God had shown himself faithful all those years, they got into the promised land and they decided, hey, there's some other gods being served in this land. Let, let's, let's get involved in, in serving some of those. Joshua referred to them, the gods of the Amorites, also the Canaanites. It's two terms for the same people in that land, in the promised land. We know that they had fall, fallen into serving the gods of the Canaanites, the Amorites. How do we know this? Because Joshua said in verse 23, Now therefore put away the strange gods which are among you. Hey, they had slipped into serving idols even as God was clearing the land for them. And Joshua said, you've got to get rid of those things. Yeah, I'm about to be gone. What are you going to do? Hey, we're going to de declare right now we are completely dependent on God. He is first place and only place in our life. We're going to get rid of these idols. We, we've slipped. We've fallen. We've let things come into our lives that shouldn't be there. Hey, it's the new year. So now's a good time to get rid of some stuff. Now's a good time for a fresh start. I'm going to get rid of some things that I somehow I lost track. I lost sight of what I was supposed to be focused on. I allowed things into my life last year. Maybe it was because, you know what, hey, I was bored. It was pandemic time. It was quarantine. I was stuck at home and I allowed things into my life, into my thoughts, into my mind that I shouldn't have. I've got to get rid of those things. I've got to cleanse, be cleansed by God. I've got to confess my sins. I've got to make, make, my, make a, 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 a atonement or a repentance to God. I've got to ask him to forgive me. I've got to get right with them. Children of Israel said, we've let some things in. We've slipped. We've, we've let some things slide right in. Joshua, we're telling you right now, we're getting rid of all of it. It's only God for us. It's only God. Is there anything we need to get rid of? Is there any idols that we need to tear down and say, God, it's only you. We're not going to have anything else. But then the third thing. Again, they, they declared their dependence on God and him alone. They denied their, their, their dedication to the false gods, to the, to the idols. They said, we're not going to have those anymore. And then finally what I see here. And this one, it's not as clear, but I think once, once uh, we look at it, we'll, we'll understand. The third thing that I see in this passage is that Israel dedicated their descendants to following God. Verse 25 through 28, Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. 
So Joshua let the people depart, every man into his own inheritance. When Joshua challenged the people, he wasn't just challenging those who were standing there that day. Remember, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When Joshua declared that, Joshua wasn't just saying, as for me and my house, that one, that one, and that one, that are alive right now that live with me today. He said, hey, I'm going to lead my children and grandchildren. I'm going to lead any of my family members that I have contact with before I die. I'm going to lead them in the way that it, what it means to follow after the one true God. And I'm going to set up a, 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 a lifestyle for them so that they will then pass that on to future generations. What are you going to do? And, and the people said, hey, this isn't just about us. The fathers and the mothers and the grandfathers and grandmothers didn't just stand up and say, I will serve the Lord and I'm going to do this. When they stood up, what they were committing to wasn't just I'll do this. It was, I'll do this and I'll teach future generations to do it too. Because listen, we're going to see in a few weeks that we are, we are very close. And it would be so easy to be just one or two generations away from a godless society. From a godless society who doesn't know a thing about God, doesn't worship God, and doesn't want anything to do with God. We are only a generation or two away if we do not do what we're supposed to do. We are only a generation or two away from every church in the United States being closed. And we're going to see in the next week or two of how that could happen. But they said, hey, this isn't just about us. The elders, the leaders of each tribe, each family stood up and said, we're going to follow God and we're going to teach our, our descendants to follow God also. The parents and the grandparents serving the Lord and teaching the young ones to do the same. And as a sign that they were doing this, and again, this is a, as, we, as we put all this together, this is a sign that it wasn't just for them. Joshua said, I'm going to set up a stone. This stone is a reminder. Now this is at the end of Joshua, in Joshua 24, but early in Joshua, Joshua chapter number 4, he did the same thing. When they had crossed over the Jordan onto the other side, they took rocks from the middle of the Jordan. They carried them over. They actually set up two sets of rocks. While the waters were still divided, they set up rocks in the middle of the Jordan. No one would see that. But the people that went through would know they were there. But on the other side of the Jordan, in Joshua chapter 4, we read this. That this may be a sign among you. That when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, That the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. You see, in Joshua 4, he said, because of what God has done, I'm going to set some stones here. And what's going to happen is future generations are going to see these. And they're going to say, what's that all about? And that's when you say, I'm glad you asked. That's when God brought us through the Jordan. Miraculously brought us through, divided the waters, led the whole nation of Israel through on dry ground. That's what that means. And so Joshua 24. Joshua, we're, we're going to declare our dependence on God. We're going to deny these false gods and not have anything to do with them. And, and Joshua, we're not just committing it for us. We're committing it for all of our future generations. And he said, okay, then here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a rock. We're going to set up a stone, just like the ones we did over when we crossed the Jordan. And so this wasn't just for those who were there that day. He could have said the same thing here. So that when your children ask you, what's that stone all about? You can tell them. That right there, that's when Joshua challenged us before he died. And, and we stood up and we declared that we would serve the Lord and we would get rid of all the idols that we allowed in our lives. And listen up, Junior, here's the other thing. That's when I said I was going to make sure you knew the story. And I was going to make sure to raise you in a way that would please and honor God. I was going to bring you up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I was going to make sure that you never forgot what God had done for us and how good he had been and how powerful he was and how much we depend on him for everything. Even the very breath that we breathe. That's what that rock means. And so in that day, they were dedicating more than just themselves. They were dedicating their descendants to God too. 
I, I wonder if there's ever been a time, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, have you ever done that? Have you ever said, God, I'm going to serve you with everything that I am. I, I love you. I depend on you. I know everything I have is because of you. God, may I never stop telling future generations about that. God, I've got kids, grandkids. I've got nieces and nephews. I've got kids in the neighborhood. I, I need to make sure that they know the truth, too. Listen, it's not just about you. You may love God and serve God. And, and the day that you die, you had never told any, any other generation about that. We're just a generation or two away from a godless society. And we're going to see that in Judges, how that it could happen so quickly. And so as Joshua, the book of Joshua drew to a close, people have made some pretty bold promises before God. I mean, they, they were very clear. There was no question like, we're probably going to serve God. Okay, Joshua, we're probably going to do that, but we're just, we're looking at some options right now. Okay, we're looking to see, you know, who has the best benefits. The false God, or I'm sorry, the idols, because at the time, you know, they may not thought false God. The idols do best for us, or will, will Jehovah do? No, there was no wishy-washiness. There was no, I wonder what we should do. It was very solid. It was firm. We will serve God. And so we finish up the book of Joshua, and the people have made some pretty bold promises to God. Spiritually and militarily, they are... Man, they're in a good place at the end of Joshua. But within the first two chapters of Judges, we're going to see them in somewhere completely different. Militarily, spiritually, they are nowhere near where they were in Joshua 24. And again, it's not five, six hundred years later. It's just within a few years. They're in a completely different place. Yes, they had made some promises, but a promise is only as good as its practice. I could promise you I will do anything. I will promise you, hey, tomorrow I'm coming over to your house and I'm cleaning out the garage and I'm doing all of this. Tomorrow comes and goes and you don't see me. What good was my promise? It was nothing more than words. A promise is only as good as its practice. As we finish up today, I know I told you it was a study on the book of Judges and we didn't even look at Judges. I'm going to share one verse with you from Judges. And really, when I tell you this verse, again, it's kind of like spoiler alert, okay? This basically is going to summarize the entire book of Judges for you. As a matter of fact, I could tell you this verse, and then you're going to be like, well, I don't need to come anymore. I already know how the story ends. Because it is the very, don't do that, though, please. Please don't do that. This verse that I'm going to share with you is the last verse in the book of Judges. That's why I say it's a spoiler. I'm telling you the ending of the movie already. The very last verse says this, Judges 21, 25. It'll be on the screen. In those days, there was no king in Israel. That's not the emphasis here. The second half is. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We're going to see God's faithfulness throughout the book of Judges. We're going to see how that even when the people would rebel, God being faithful would allow them to be punished. He would allow others to come in and, and conquer them. And then he would deliver them when they repented. He was faithful throughout that time over and over and over again. He delivered them. And at the end of all of it, the people did that which was right in their own eyes. What a difference that is from the end of Joshua to the end of Judges. We're going to declare our dependence on God for everything. We're not going to worship any idols. We're going to raise up our kids in a way that they'll know exactly who God is and that they should give their lives to Him. All things that you and I should do. When we finish our study of Judges, what will be your testimony and what will be mine? Will it be at the beginning of this study? You know what? Just like Israel, man, I recognize that I'd, I've got to depend on God. And I, I, I declare that I promised, promised to him everything. I, I'm going I'm to uh, depend on him for everything. And I'm going to worship him. And I'm going to train my kids to him. I'm going to raise them in the right way. But then we get to the end of Judges. It's probably a few months away. Are we going to get to the end of Judges? And we're going to read that last verse. And you're going to say, hmm. That's not what I said that first Sunday in January. I said I was going to follow him. But you know what? I spent the last few months pretty much doing my own thing. I spent the last few months letting some stuff back in. And now I'm just kind of doing whatever I want to. Every man doing right in his own eyes. What's it going to be for you today? You see, we can make all the promises we want to, but unless we follow through with them, they're empty and they're worthless. 
Every promise of God is faithful and true. What kind of promises are you making today? Let's pray. Lord, as we begin this study in the book of Judges, we're going to see a people in Joshua 24 who, for all intents and purposes, if we put it the way we would normally say things in our day, they were sold out to you. They were focused on you. They knew from where all their help came from. They knew who they needed to trust in. They knew everything was all about you. But as we read the last verse of Judges just now, over the next several years of the history of Israel, they turned away. They strayed. Regardless of how many times you delivered them, you brought them back, you, you, you punished them when that was necessary. Regardless, still at the end of Judges, we see that everyone was doing what they wanted to do and what was right in their own eyes. Lord, we've got a group of people here today in this service that if we would all commit to live for you, and commit to train future generations to live for you. And we would be focused on you. And we would get rid of idols in our lives. And if we would not just promise it but actually do it. Lord you could turn the world upside down just using the people here today. We know that's true because in Acts it says that the disciples. The, the, the disciples turned the world upside down. There were only 12 of them. So Lord may we not just say empty words today. But may we make a commitment and follow through with it that we're going to live for you and we're not going to have anything else in our lives that is contrary to you. May each one here, whether they're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, regardless, whoever has children that they have an influence over, Lord, may we all commit to making sure that future generations know who you are and know how mighty you are and know that you are the only way to heaven. Lord, I pray that today as we start this year that there'll be people that commit to living for you. Those that may have strayed, maybe we allowed something in our lives we shouldn't have. We'll get rid of that. And we'll promise and we'll carry through with living for you. Changing our church, our community, our homes, our workplaces, our schools. Lord, we pray your will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen.